Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. The repo market broke, uh, what was it, September 16th of last year. So it's basically a, a year a year ago. Um, the Fed stepped up and night after night they were pumping 50 to $100 billion into, uh, into the repo market just to, to keep it tame. Uh, rates on the 16th went from roughly 1% to 10%. And I mean, that was, that was a shock. Um, uh, and it looking back upon it, um, uh, really what, what, if you want to say saved the repo market, you could say the coronavirus saved the repo market because what that did was it, it, slackened demand all over the world um, for capital. I mean, it, it slowed the system down, so the demand for money slowed down. And at the same time, it gave uh, the Fed, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, it gave all these central banks the ability to step up and just flood the markets with money. So the repo market wasn't fixed by any means at all, but it became hidden. It just became... Uh, background noise, if you will, and it was covered by literally the trillions that the central banks pumped into the system. Absolutely. And I, I wanted to also get your thoughts on on what we could see the next um, piece of that puzzle start to break and, and really maybe take down the system. Obviously, they can't let um, yields go up on bonds. So what could we see or what are your thoughts on what could happen next? Well, I've been an advocate oh, for, say, at least the last five years that it's all about the credit markets. It's not about the stock markets. The stock markets are uh, for public view, if you will. The real nuts and bolts are the credit markets themselves. And one aspect of the credit markets is that one man's liability is another man's asset. And if you and I'm, I'm going to concentrate now on uh, what's happened over the last six months with this coronavirus, everybody shut down. People are 150 plus days now late on their mortgages, late on their rent, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got a moratorium on foreclosures. You have a moratorium on evictions. And, you know, that's nice. That's good. People aren't getting kicked out on the streets. However, behind the scenes, that means that the, the debt is not being serviced. And if it's not being serviced, that cash flow is not getting to the owners of the debt. So on one hand, you know, you're, you're placating uh, or putting salve on the wound of people who, who can't pay their mortgage. So, so one man's uh, liability is another man's asset, and we're now seeing debt not being serviced. The general economy is no longer generating the cash flow necessary to service the debt, and that's the problem, is that we're 150 days late. It's never going to be caught up on, and the bottom line is the credit markets were breaking anyway, and this has basically broken the back of the credit markets. Interesting, Bill. You have a couple very good sayings and interesting articles on your guys' website. As we're speaking about the debt, one of the things that was highlighted was that the U.S. government debt will exceed the size of the economy for the first time since World War II. And one of the things I'd, I'd like to 
get your thoughts on was to go through a little bit of the numbers of the U.S. paying off the debt with their quote unquote gold reserves. Two years ago, it would have put the price of gold at something like $87,000 an ounce. So what right. do you think those numbers could be today? Oh, it's well over $100,000 now. Uh, I think the last I, the last time I looked at it, you were looking at a hundred and I think it was $120,000 per ounce to pay the debt. That's if we have the gold that we say we have and there's no more debt added upon what we already have, which we know is, uh, I mean, we, we know that's, that's going to increase every single year. So the number is going to increase and the number is suspect anyway. Let me say we probably do not have the amount of gold that we say we have because it's not been audited since 1956. So that, that number is a minimum number. Absolutely. And it, do you think that is just because the gold reserves could have just been used up and then they don't want to audit it to show that vulnerability? The gold reserves could have been leased out. Um, and this is something that GATA had talked about back in the early 2000s, that the, the gold has been, been leased out. There could be gold in Fort Knox that's been leased out and is no longer treasury gold. There's all sorts of nefarious schemes to chip away at the gold reserves. We know that no gold has been added for however many years, what is it, 40, 50 years. But there are many ways that gold could have leaked out over the years and we just don't know about it because, like I said, there's not been an audit. Even assuming that all the gold we say we have is there, it is ours, you're still looking at 120000 plus per ounce just to pay the debt back. So one of the other countries that we know has a ton, <laughs> funny saying, but probably 20,000 plus tons of gold is China. Can you talk a little bit to us about the history of their fiat currencies and, and why they're so protected by that gold stockpile? Well, China has blown up more paper currencies than any other nation on the planet going back over, you know, over a thousand years. They're well aware of what happens to fiat currencies when they're abused. And China China plays the long game. Their five-year plan is like our quarter to quarter. I mean, they look out 100 years. Look what they did with the Panama Canal. Look what they did with, with Hong Kong. I mean, they do a 100, 200-year lease, knowing that generations to follow are going to benefit from what they're doing presently. And they've accumulated gold. They understand that gold is non-liability money. And they also know that all fiat currencies eventually blow up. If you go back to 1971, what was it? Mao said that we can now see the, the end of the United States in sight. Simply because we got taken, they took the dollar off the gold standard. Right, exactly. After, yeah, August 15th, 71 is when we went off the gold standard and that was Mao's comment. So even even since 2000, we've seen the dollar lose 87% of its value versus gold. Obviously, we can point towards the dollar basically being hyperinflated away, correct? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, the dollar 80, 90 years ago was interchangeable with gold. I mean, you could go into the bank with $20 and walk out with an ounce of gold or vice versa. And now uh, that there's no tie at all to gold, the dollar is the mirror image of gold, and it's it, and gold has not gone up. It's it's the fact that the purchasing power of the, of the dollar has dropped. That's why it takes more dollars to purchase one ounce. And obviously, that's true in in many many currencies now, all across. Well, the in world. all currencies, yeah, in all currencies. As a matter of fact, the dollar was the last currency where gold went to a, a new high you know, just the last few months, but gold had, putting it correctly, currencies had gone to new lows versus gold, all all foreign currencies except the dollar. The dollar was the last one. So, Bill, what would be the difference between gold being treated as a shiny shiny rock or as a commodity, and when do you think that we could see that, that shift in how gold is treated? Um, you're, you're talking about perception. And it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint human nature as to to when you know when the tipping point will be that that people 
view gold only as money and not as jewelry and, you know, not as a, a shiny rock. But in fact, it has always been money. It's always been non-liability money. And that's the important aspect to gold is that it is no one's liability. It's not issued by a central bank, and thus it can't be debased. One of your articles recently was saying that force majeure is will be a widely known term by the time 2020 is over. Can you define that for us and maybe give us a couple of examples of where that could be used? Well, when I wrote that, I was was specifically talking about the gold and silver markets not being delivered on by COMEX. And in fact, what you're seeing now are hugely outsized delivery demands month after month after month. And as a matter of fact, the COMEX just a couple of weeks back allowed gold to be uh, deposited into COMEX from, I think, what was it, double or triple the amount of, of uh, refineries. So what they're trying to do is vacuum gold up from all over the world because they have this demand. So when we're when we're talking about those kind of, let's say, shadow games or, or the way that they are able to kind of shift the numbers around. I was listening to another interview with you where you were saying that the, the paper, paper contracts are holding down the price of silver. And once silver is able to break free of that downward pressure, it can't go by itself and, and gold will go as well. So what kind of demand and, and what real factors are at the back of pushing silver higher? I think the underlying thought process there is that for many, many years, we've had the price suppressed by naked con contracts being sold into or onto the market, which depressed the price. And those were, were naked contracts. And for years and years, there was there, there's always been delivery demand, but there's never been huge delivery demand. And now all of a sudden, the, the demand to deliver gold, the demand to deliver silver has just exploded. So what's going to show the world that the, the king has no clothes is when COMEX cannot come up with the gold to make the delivery on contracts that were sold. That's what will break the precious metals free to the upside. It's, it's really been like the tail has wagged the dog for all these years, the dog being the physical and the tail being the, the contracts. So, Bill, do you have any idea when we could see that possibly happen, like the, the COMEX actually not be able to deliver? Uh, I think we're in the process of that happening. I mean, you, you're, you're seeing last month on, on uh, gold, I think it was, what, 157 tons, which is as much as was normally delivered, say, five years ago for the entire year. So I think we're in the process of it happening as we speak. Interesting. You guys also speak about about two resets, one financial, and then we're going to have uh, Mother's Nature's Mother Nature's reset as well. Could you go through what those two resets are going to look like, Bill? Okay. To just correct you a little bit, the first one's not a financial reset. The first one is a man-made reset. In other words, it's an it's an edict. It's a it's a reset where those in power still retain retain power. But the first reset will be somewhat like moving the, the deck chairs around on the Titanic. It won't work because the currencies themselves are still fiat. And we're going to have to get to the point where currencies are there, – there's confidence in, in currencies because they have real backing. And I guess uh, I, I, another way to explain it is – Right now, if you're, if you sell an ounce of gold or you sell an ounce of silver, you're going to get dollars for it, or you're going to get yen or euros or pounds or rubles or whatever, but you're going to get paper currency. So you're back in the system. The second reset, that's when people at this point, there's no sense in selling your gold or your silver because you're not getting anything real in return. But upon the second reset, once there's a currency that can be trusted, that is backed by something, something real, and more than likely gold slash silver, then yeah, you can, with confidence, liquidate your gold, put it into currency, and then use you know your currency for, for whatever you need it for. But the point being, 
You're not going back into the frying pan of a fiat. You're not giving something away that's real for something that's fake. You're trading something that's real for something that's backed by, by something real. Very similar to what the United States had before 1933 when we were on a true gold standard. So when we talk about the man-made reset, could we see Nasera or Jacera play a role in that? Uh, you're going to see all kinds of games play a play a role in that. And I mean, there's been talk for quite a few years that they're going to try to do it with, with the SDR. And the problem with that is the SDR is what? A basket of fiat currencies. Whatever the first reset is, it will not hold because it's not going to truly be a reset. It'll, it'll look like one on the outside, but the guts of it will not truly be a reset where somebody goes to work, gets paid at the end of the week, and they get something that's sound money, if you will. One consideration when we're talking about these resets and, and something that you've talked a little bit about is the fixed income asset destruction. For example, pension funds just not being backed by anything, obviously. Can you t tell us a little bit more about how you see that progressing? Um, I think the best way to, to describe it is everything financial is worth nothing. And the reason being, I mean, look, look at a 30-year treasury bond or a 10-year treasury bond that pays, you know, less than, pays less than 1% or pays 1.5% or whatever. If interest rates were to move just 1%, it would destroy the value of these things. And during the, the time period or the term of the bonds, what do they promise to pay you? They promise to pay you dollars. And you just got done saying that since January of 2000, the dollar has lost 87% of its purchasing power versus gold. So if you bought a 30-year bond in 2000, and back then you probably had, uh, if my memory served me correctly, you probably had a... I don't know, 5% or 6% yield. So yields have crashed and the bond has gone way up in value, but in dollars. And those dollars have lost 87% of their purchasing power. So unless the bond has gone up 87%, which they haven't, you've lost purchasing power, even though on paper it looks like, wow, you, you know, it was a home run. So that's what, what I'm, I'm talking about is that everything financial that promises to pay you in fiat currency is going to be wiped out for two reasons. And the two reasons are when interest rates do finally normalize because you have to, in order for a currency to, to truly have value, you have to be able to lend it and get paid interest on it. And that's not the case today. And then the other part of the equation is that when interest rates do normalize, the entire credit structure is going to be crushed. It's an interesting perspective to hold. Obviously, we've seen recently a, a couple pension funds try to add gold to their portfolios. Do you think that this is going to be beneficial for them, or are they doing it in the right way? I don't. I really don't know whether they're buying physical metal or whether they're doing it through the ETFs. If they're doing it through the ETFs, I think that's laughable. And I think if if pension plans across the board were to try to put 1% of their assets into physical gold, they would completely dry up the market. There'd be no physical, there wouldn't be any physical uh, physical to buy. You know, they'd, they'd clean up the, they'd clean the supply up. Yeah, that's a, a, a crazy, crazy scenario to think about. And all of these, these factors kind of lead me to something that your partner, Jim Sinclair, came up with is... GOTS. Uh, can you tell us what that stands for and, and a little bit about it? Yeah, Jim came up with that thinking it was back in 2004, maybe. And it stands for get out of the system. And what he w was and is an advocate for is basically getting your capital under your own control, whereas you don't have the liability of someone else. If they go bankrupt, you lose your money i.e. your broker, if they're holding your stocks and they go bankrupt, it might take you five years to get your stock back. If you have an annuity and the insurance company goes bankrupt, what does that mean to your to your account or what does that mean to your, your monthly check if that's what you're taking? 
In other words, he was an advocate of if you own stock, have them issue the certificate so you have it in hand. That's your that's your proof that you own it. And the entire world could go bankrupt, but you're still that portion owner of whatever company that certificate represents. And as far as gold and silver, you don't purchase gold and silver and hold it in an unallocated account, a pooled account, because who's to say that the gold is really there? And and if that company were to go bankrupt, again, you have the problem of going through the the court system in order to get or re-get control of your capital. Whereas an ounce of gold or an ounce of silver in your hand or in a private non-bank vault, you know it really exists. You know that it's real physical metal and you and you have access to it. So basically what he was getting at is as to the best of your ability, become your own central bank, become your own depository. Hold your hold as many assets as you can out of the system so that if you have institutions that go bankrupt, they don't take your capital with them. So, Bill, what are what are some more uh, considerations that you would say are are part of becoming your own central bank? What type of bullion or or gold and silver products do you ideally want to own? Uh, we could talk about individual products. I mean, in the U.S., if uh, right now, uh, probably the the best things to own are the pre thirty uh, three liberties and St. Gaudens. If there was a confis- confiscation, those would be considered your coin collection. You want U.S. If you're a U.S. citizen, you want U.S. mint lineage coins. If there is a confiscation, certainly bars, generic coin, and more than likely foreign sovereigns would be the first to be confiscated. And this is a little bit off topic, but it's important to not only be your own central bank, but it's important with what's going on in society right now that you become as self-sufficient as you possibly can. Human nature take over, you're seeing people leave the cities en masse and moving out to the suburbs. You're seeing the suburbs move from where they are even further out. The idea is, I have no idea how long it will be from one reset to the next, but there's going to be a time where you're gonna be able to rely on only one person and or group and that's yourself, your family, your immediate uh, people around you, which means you want to be able to, to eat. You want to have a source of clean water. If you can afford to do something in the way of generating electricity, you want to be able to protect your position, your assets, your food, etc. You want to become as self-sufficient as you can. And that is all part of God's getting out of the system. In other words, you're not relying on the system to keep you afloat. Makes a lot of sense, Bill. A lot of our listeners are investors in junior mining stocks. And I'd like to get your thoughts on basically the, the potential we could see of these mining stocks that are holding ounces in the ground and how how they could be basically in a way, revalued in this in this coming reset? Yeah, I think they'll be massively revalued and revalued probably more than anything else. But I guess a, a good way to answer your question is, what do you think ounces in the ground will be valued at if you can't buy ounces above ground? In other words, the junior mining sector that holds uh, reserves in the ground will be the last effort or last place and investors will be able to get exposure to gold. What are the risks or considerations when we're looking at holding basically those mining stocks and being able to sell them back out when we you know, profit from them back into a fiat currency? Is that something that you have like thought through to be able to um, save that capital? Well, have you considered that if you have a certificate in hand, you can sign that certificate over for whatever, whatever you need. If you need a car, you need a house. In other words, a certificate in hand is actually barterable. You're looking at, at an asset that's going to be revalued many multiples, the percentage of the rise, if you will, of the price of gold and silver. And the reason you get many multiples is because of the 
uh, the perceived operating leverage of the companies. Perfect. So what are some of the considerations that you look at when you're looking at, at some of these junior mining companies to invest in? Well, you want to look at where they are. You want to look at whether the government's stable. You want to look at management. You want to look at uh, how many ounces in the ground now. You want to know are the best place to find gold is where they've already found gold. So are you on a trend where you've got a big mine to your east and a big mine to your west? You know, it's, it's important what district is your, your mining company in? Kind of what kind of production have they had to your north, south, east, and west? What kind of production has there been in the past? Do you have any, any uh, concluding thoughts as we wrap up? I would just, uh, like I was getting at before, try to become as, as self-sufficient as you possibly can. If you can. If you can go out and stock up on food all at once, do it. If you don't have the means to do that every time you go to the store, you know, spend an extra 10 or $20 and buy food in bulk if you can, because there is going to be a period of time, and I don't know whether it's going to be two weeks, two months, God forbid, two years, but there's going to be a time where you're going to look back and say, you know, I had an extra $500. I wish I had spent it on food when I could have bought it or water or what have you, but prepare to be on your own. I guess would be my concluding thought.